and not a cutter and became a psychiatrist as a direct result of the influence of Francis Welding and Elise Gilotti. And I thank them from the bottom of my heart for that blessing. I cannot properly introduce her because you know her credentials. Any words that I would have to say would be probably just not even nearly close to the magnitude as well as the gratitude that we owe this woman. Last year, I gave a few words in the form of a prose, and I think I'll just abbreviate those and do it a little bit again this year. Well, brothers and sisters, it seems only right that on this Saturday night that we would be in this place to finally get the record straight. Our ancestors have given us the right to sing the praises of one Frances Welsing. She told the story, of, the melanin story she told that made us know that we were so bad, so black, and so bold. Praises be to Francis Weldon. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am thrilled to be here at the fourth annual Melanin Conference. I hope my eyes don't look too tired. I was in New Orleans before, but here I am. I feel that the ancestors have been invoked this evening, and I feel that uh, they have given me the charge, and they continue to give me the charge to recruit for the Army of Justice. To recruit males and females and females and males that are going to take their melanin selves and lead this army that is going to end the greatest injustice that has ever been on the planet Earth. And that is the injustice of racism and the injustice of white supremacy. <laughs> An injustice that I maintain began because some people had the misfortune not to have melanin. I was going to entitle my remarks, The Gold Mine of Melanin. There is a gold mine in melanin, but we have a problem that we have to solve before there can be the full expression of the power of melanin. And recently, I've got my board up here so I can go to work. <laughs> recently, I have begun to think about our task in terms of a pyramid. And really, we can call this army of justice we can really begin to call ourselves the pyramid builders. And at the top of this pyramid, we have justice. And we've got this eye at the top of the pyramid. And we can talk about that in a little while. But I say that at the base of the pyramid is the dynamic of truth. Truth revealed.
truth revealed about racism and about white supremacy. At this next level, going up this pyramid, we have to place understanding. Because we not only have to reveal truth, but we have to have an understanding in depth of what it is that we have revealed. And then we have all of the areas of people activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. Those are the areas of people activity through which we have to express our understanding and our knowledge of truth. Atop the areas of people activity, the next level has to do with what has happened to us. And what has happened to us is that we have learned to despise and to hate melanin. And as a result of that, we do not have unity and we do not have the force and power that we need to bring about justice. Some of the forms of that hate are reflected in patterns of behavior such as gossiping, name calling, squabbling, squabbling with one another, cursing one another being discourteous, being disrespectful, stealing from one another, robbing one another, fighting one another, killing one another, using and selling drugs to one another. This is the power of racism and the power of white supremacy. Throwing down trash, making children believe that they can be adequate mothers and fathers leading to teen pregnancy, pretending that racism does not exist. And then we're going to put at the next layer of the pyramid some things that we were taught in the principles of Kwanzaa by Ron Kawinga some things that we need to focus on. I may not have them in order, and if I forget any of them, help me out. <laughs> Unity, purpose, creativity, faith, self-determination, collective work and responsibility, and cooperative economics. That's it, isn't it? Okay. Don't anybody come up here and try to read this. I hope you're making notes. <laughs> you won't be able to read this. Atop that, we are going to put something from the work of Neely Fuller, the four uses of time for the victims of white supremacy. He has suggested and recommended that we discipline ourselves and use our time, energy, in four ways, in four ways alone. Number one is constructive conversation. Constructive conversation is discussions about racism and how we're gonna solve the problem of white supremacy. Constructive activity, That means building, repairing, making, entrepreneuring, all kinds of things that are constructive, activity. Three, sufficient eating and sleeping, and hold your seats. Sexual intercourse no more than twice a week so you stop worrying about it. <laughs> Is everybody with that? <laughs> Now this is what we are trying to achieve 
It is a difficult task, but so was it difficult to build the original pyramid. Lifting those gigantic stones that constructed the original pyramids is something akin to what it is that we must do to bring about this revolution so that there is justice on the planet and that there is peace in the universe. I want this army that I am attempting to recruit to be able to go out, each and every soldier, to be able to go out into the world, wherever it is that they travel, wherever it is that they live, and to share knowledge and understanding of racism. I think that one of our greatest challenges and one of the things that is going to bring us very great results is that when we use the word racism to be able to say exactly and very clearly what it is that we are talking about. Simply to use the R word is not sufficient because people will come along and say, well, you're saying that I'm racist and I'm saying that you're racist. Everybody's a racist, right? <laughs> no, racism means white supremacy and we can go on to detail it from that point. I say that racism is a global system of behavior organized by persons who classify themselves as white, whether consciously or subconsciously determined. The goal objective is for white genetic survival on the planet Earth and to prevent white genetic annihilation. Because on this planet, the vast majority of people have melanin in their skins and they are black, brown, red, and yellow all of those people are genetically dominant compared to people who classify themselves as white. Now that's very long-winded, but I certainly hope that we can begin to master that definition or some definition of racism so that when we use that word, we can say, this is what we're talking about. And if you're talking to someone who classifies him or herself as white, and then you challenge them and you say, not a hostile challenge, an intellectual analytical challenge, and you say, what is the definition that you are using? And if your experience is the same as mine, then they come to a halt. They are not able to succinctly describe what it is that they're talking about, but that does not stop us. Now there may be some persons in the audience who haven't heard me talk about racism, so let me just drop back a little bit and share with you how I came to understand racism in the way that I understand it. I met Neely Fuller in 1967. Neely Fuller is a guard at the Bureau of Engraving in the District of Columbia. He had started writing about racism during the Korean War and he made a very profound conclusion. I consider it to be profound. He said racism was a system. It's not institutional, it is a system. A system encompasses institutions. He said racism is a system, the system is global. It is global as well as local. That means it can be here in Dallas or New Orleans, but it is also all over the world. There is no place on planet Earth where racism defined as white supremacy does not exist. It is everywhere. He went further to say, unlike Karl Marx, who said that economics caused racism, Neely Fuller turned that upside down and said that the system of white supremacy establishes specific patterns of behavior in all areas of people activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. So that everything that is done 24 hours a day by this collective is for the purpose of establishing, 
maintaining, expanding, and refining white supremacy. So when I heard this gentleman say that, my brain computer said that man is really saying something. And I wondered what would cause them to establish this behavioral dynamic that it seemed the places that I had been on planet Earth, the few places that I had been, every place, this system was intact. I remember when I first went to Europe, I thought, well, it probably won't be there. <laughs> it was there. When I went to Mexico, it was there. Go to the Bahamas, it is there. It is everywhere, okay? So I said, why, what would cause it? And I came to the conclusion that what was producing this global pattern of behavior that was causing us to have so much grief was the fact that on this planet, one-tenth of the people have white skin, nine-tenths of the people are black, brown, red, and yellow. And the black, brown, red, and yellow people, unlike the propaganda that the people who classify themselves as white, they were busy telling us that it was the black, brown, red, and yellow people who were genetically inferior, but indeed it was they who were feeling genetically inadequate because all of the black, brown, red, and yellow people are genetically dominant in terms of skin coloration to the people who are classified as white. So around the 13th, 14th century, or after the people who left Europe and circumnavigated the planet and found out that every place they landed, the people were colored. There was no place outside of Europe where there were people who were classified as white. Everybody on planet Earth was colored, and if these white male persons in these little boats stopped and had sexual intercourse with the ladies of color and waited for nine months, they found out about genetic dominance without having a big genetics laboratory. They found that all of the children, when you mix white plus black, white plus brown, white plus red, white plus yellow, equals color. So they learned something that was very, very critical. They had found out this information from the time that people who classify themselves as white began to come into Africa long time ago. They also found that white was genetically annihilated. By the time they circumnavigated the planet and found that there were non-white people or people of color everywhere on the planet, they understood that they had a very, very serious problem, and that serious problem was that white could be genetically annihilated. Now, I don't know how many people in this audience saw the Time Magazine cover for April the 9th. How many people saw that? Very good. Everybody should go to their library, and I believe it is April 9th. The April 9th issue of Time Magazine because their cover said what is going to happen when whites are no longer the majority in this area of the world that we call the United States of America. And the prediction is that in a very short period of time, by the year 2000, that the majority of people in this area of the world will be blacks or African, Hispanics, and Asians. Now that article I recommend very highly to everyone because they are talking about things are going to change for us and that there are going to be some serious problems that we are going to face. And in addition to having that statement on the cover of the magazine, the picture itself was very, very interesting. If you will recall, there was a picture of a flag you recall it? And the flag basically was the so-called American flag. It had blue in the corner, but it didn't even have white stars. <laughs> the stripes, in place of the red and white stripes, they had a red stripe 
and then a black stripe, and then another red stripe, and then a brown stripe, and then another red stripe, and then a yellow stripe. And I saw this and I said, wonderful. <laughs> but I said, wonderful for another reason. I said, wonderful because I had written a paper some time ago talking about the symbolism of the flag. And I had said that those colors, red, white, and blue, had another level of meaning other than patriotism. <laughs> that the red, white, and blue on the flag actually stood for white skin through which you could see blue veins and red arterioles. And so that is the reason that most of the flags that represent people who classify themselves as white are either white and blue or white and red or red, white, and blue. Think about it. Now beyond that, I said that the flag was a symbolic abstraction of the problem. And the problem when there's a concern about genetic power is the power of the male. The reason being is because it is only men, whether they are white, black, brown, red, or yellow, that can impose sexual intercourse. Is that right? Yeah. See that silence? <laughs> People are trying to figure whether that's right. <laughs> okay. It is only men who can impose sexual intercourse. A male can decide that he is going to force a female to have sexual intercourse. Ladies, don't try it. If a female decides that she's going to force the male to have sexual intercourse and she gets a Uzi or M16 rifle and she approaches him and she frightens him to death, there's not going to be any performance. <laughs> okay. Right? <laughs> right? Okay. So that the question about genetic dominance is a question that concerns gentlemen. And so I said in the paper that I wrote some time ago that if you look, that's the, what, head on front view of male genitalia, but this is a lateral view. And if you make an abstraction and the brain makes abstractions all the time, I guess that's a very good way that it can store a whole lot of data. And if you make an abstraction, of the lateral view of the male genitalia, you have a flag. Can you see that? <laughs> so that when the flag is red, white, and blue, it means that a testicle produces white skin through which you can see blue veins and red arterioles. You get it? So Time Magazine just proved my point and I was thrilled because they took the white out <laughs> and put on the flag black, brown, and yellow. Do you understand? And I bet if I went and found that artist, he would say, no, that didn't, that isn't what that is. Okay, but the ex-president Ronald Reagan, in his past autobiography entitled, Where is the Rest of Me? <laughs> That's the name of it. But he said that when he was born, he said his father was a first generation black Irishman. But his father said that when Reagan was born, that his skin was white, his bottom was red, and his face was blue. And ever since then, the red, white, and blue has been significant and important to him. But can you see, I don't think he really understood, but he was saying that white, his father was so glad he was white, that that is the significance. So all of these furor and the laws that they're trying to develop and pass about you can't desecrate the flag is a symbolic way of saying that you cannot castrate white males. 
which is why there was a song saying a long time ago, the old flag can never touch the ground. Because if the flag was indeed the symbol of the testicles, if a testicle cuts the touches the ground, it means that there has taken place a castration. Do you follow? Okay. So instead of talking about sex on the job, run this down. <laughs> From this discussion, I understood something that was very, very significant in our history, the lynching and castration of black men. And you know, we haven't been able to talk about that out loud very much. I mean, it's still very horrible and something that is very painful. I challenge us to rise to the political occasion of being able to talk about lynching and castration and to explain why it happened. That if indeed there was the fundamental fear and concern about white genetic annihilation, it would stand to reason that there would be a horrendous attack on the black female, right? No. <laughs> No, <laughs> I was just playing a trick, you all. <laughs> if there was concern about genetic annihilation on the part of the global as well as local white collective, then it would stand to reason that there would be a horrendous attack on the black male. Do you see, because it is only the male that can impose the white genetic annihilation because it's only men that can impose it, okay? So that the lynching and the castration was the expression from the white psyche, from the white male psyche specifically, but there are pictures of lynchings where you have white females and children standing around the lynched black male, you see, burning body and cheering. There are also descriptions in which the people took the genitals home. I won't say they ate them, but they took them home. You see, because there are some cultures where to this day, people go in bars and eat the testicles of bulls. Bulls, 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 bulls. <laughs> How many people are aware of that or know that? Okay, now, this is a, supposedly a, a particular male delicacy. I won't say for black males, but if we understand our ancient history, Osiris, the Egyptian god that has been described as lord of the perfect black, the symbol of Osiris was the bull. You see, so when people are eating bulls' balls, they are trying to ingest the power of the black male, okay? <laughs> now, after I figured this out, I remember one day I was sitting at home and looking at television. And there was a bullfight from somewhere in Europe on the television. I don't, we don't really have that on the television here a lot, but for some reason, there was this bullfight on the television. So I was looking at this television, and I got up to go and turn off the television because I couldn't stand the idea of their sticking those knives in that animal. And so I was horrified, and I got up to turn the television off. And just moving across the floor, I saw the expressions on the faces of the people in the audience. These were white faces and the people, <gasps> they were going out. So I said, wow. Do you see, because their reaction was quite counter to what I was feeling. And so then I said, oh, wow. 
These bullfights have something to do with lynching. Because the same people that cheered in the lynching were cheering and going into orgastic spasms watching this bull be killed. And so I said, this is, this is, this is, yeah, right, sick. I said, this has something to do with black people. So I start, you know, go to the library, you got to go to the library, go to bookstores, pull out books, stand in the bookstore, stand in the library, and let the spirit move you so you know what book to touch with your hand, because you don't have time to read all of them. And the spirit will lead you, right? So I found two books. One's very common, the Encyclopedia Britannica. And the other was Cirlo's Dictionary of Symbols. And I had this, I bought this book a long time ago and had never really looked in it. And so I just said, well, let me just look at this book. And lo and behold, in Cirlo's Dictionary of Symbols, under bull, guess what it said? The bull is a historic symbol of the Aryan superiority over the Negro. So I had to sit down with that. But when I, because it, that was the last thing I expected to read. But I said, wait a minute, something is wrong. If the bull in the bullfight was the symbol of the Aryan superiority over the Negro, they wouldn't kill the black bull so that it had been twisted and turned around, and that the bull was what? The historic symbol of the black man's superiority over white. So then I said, oh, that's what that is. And so then if you go to the Encyclopedia Britannica after that, they will tell you that bullfighting became a sport in Spain after the Moors the blacks were chased back into Africa. And the Africans had gone up into Spain and dominated Spain from the 700s to the 1400s for 700 years. And when they were finally were defeated, everybody was colored in Spain. <laughs> and so they started this symbolic activity of killing these black bulls. Do you see? And then you have little white males switch around, <laughs> shaking their you-know-what in front of the bull in suits of light. Now, do you see what I'm saying? Suits of light meaning white people. <coughs> do you understand? And so they symbolically carry out this attack on the black male in the activity that they call entertainment of the bullfight. I also understood, I mean, if you begin to understand racism, not just they won't let me go to the toilet, they won't let me live in that neighborhood, they won't let me go to that school, that's the surface phenomenon of racism. Deep beneath that surface phenomenon is the fear of white genetic annihilation and the concern for white genetic survival. Once you begin to understand this and that it is determined at conscious and subconscious levels, once you understand this, then a lot of things that you see around you every day will begin to be clear. Like I said, lynching will be clear. Eating chocolates will be clear. Is everybody into chocolates? Okay. The white supremacy, well, let me just back up and cover the tanning. Now, this is important. You see, this is important because we have been taught to what? Hate melanin. We have to be honest, we hate melanin. Nobody wants to be crystal black. Crystal black. 
he starts saying crystal black. Wow, that brother was crystal black. <laughs> wow, that sister, look at that crystal black. See, you all, you supposed to say, yeah, but I felt the vibe drop. A little bit okay for the brothers, not okay for the sisters. We're going to change that as we make this revolution. Okay. Get this understood. All of the colors are fine. But we have been taught to hate the basic color. And the way that the universe works there's no way that we are going to find the secrets of melanin as long as we hate melanin. You cannot find the meaning of melanin and simultaneously hate it. So we have to really get on top of that. But tanning, while the people who were the melanin people under the conditions of white supremacy we're taught to hate color. So all of us learn before we learn how to read. If you are black, stay back. If you're brown, stick around. If you're yellow, you're mellow. And if you're white, you're all right. 1990, they have tested black children and found that if you give a black and white doll to black children and ask which one do they want, they will select the white doll, and this is 1990. <laughs> now, don't feel bad about the children white supremacy is just riding on. If you look at television all day long, you're going to have to jar your brain to get white supremacy images out. Because all we see is white, 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 white. And if a child watches the television and the child never sees his or her image looking intelligent, then the child doesn't want to be that, that which never appears on television. Do you see, or the child doesn't want to be that silly looking person that they throw in, an occasional black, or an occasional black male child that's got his hat turned around backwards. So we have to get into understanding what a turned around backwards hat means that you don't know which direction you're supposed to go in. White supremacy understands that. That's why you will rarely, if ever, see a white male child or a white male with a hat turned around backwards. Turned around backward hats are for us, okay? But children don't want to be it because they don't see themselves on television. In addition to, this is a global system of white supremacy. The language itself teaches white supremacy. So you can watch a black weather person say it's going to be a black day today. That means it's going to be thundering, lightning, raining, hailing, everything that you don't want to face. That's supposed to be a black day. Or the stock market falls, and then they say it was Black Monday or Black Tuesday. And then we'll go around and repeat, yes, it was Black Monday. That's what we have to language under white supremacy teaches white supremacy, and so we have to systematically go through and pull out those things that are against us in the language and begin to turn it around. But the children learn, so white supremacy is being taught. Also under white supremacy, white people who we thought liked their color Unbeknownst to us, on our side of the track, we were trying to get rid of our color, wondering what kind of bath we could get into <laughs> that would take some of the melanin away. And the white people were on their side of the track, even when it was cold, trying to tan. Tanning is what? Tanning is forcing cells, the melanocytes, that under normal condition in white skin cannot produce melanin. But if you bombard those cells with the ultraviolet rays of the sun, you can force them to produce small quantities of the enzyme tyrosinase. And that enzyme is essential for the production of melanin. 
White skin is, has the absence of ty tyrosinase, and that means that white skin is albinism. A-L-B-I-N-I-S-N. M. That white people say is a genetic deficiency state. Not Francis Welsing, white people. They didn't expect that Francis Welsing would come along and say, well, this is the same as white skin. <laughs> and it is, okay. So that while they are tanning and taking every dark substance that they can conceive of into their bodies, chocolate, Coke, coffee, tea, scotch. <laughs> At least that's labeling some of them. You see, an obsession with taking dark substance into their body, in addition to calling chocolate candy erotic or chocolate cake erotic. Now, you know, Valentine's Day comes and everybody's talking about chocolate and giving ladies a Valentine box with chocolate candy and nuts in it. See, in black ladies, we're so busy being white ladies that we didn't realize we already had the chocolate with them. <laughs> See. <laughs> a long time ago when I was in Germany, they had a candy, their favorite candy, was some little chocolate babies that were called nigger babies. That was a favorite candy in Germany. Now, I don't know whether it still is today, but it was a favorite candy, eating nigger babies, taking dark babies into their system because they could not produce dark babies. Also, Germany used to drink a lot of Coca-Cola, and then they became nationalistic and said, we need to have a cola of our own. So indeed they did. That we're drinking too much Coca-Cola, let's have a German cola. And so what do you think they called the cola that they made, the national cola for Germany? <laughs> right, somebody said it. Africola. Africola with a palm tree on the bottle, with all that dark substance. You would have thought they would call it German or Deutsches Cola. No. They called it Africola to prove what it is that I'm saying. Take black substance from Africa and put it in the body that under normal circumstances cannot produce color. This also feeds into why white females at the same time that they are accusing black males of wishing to rape them they have all kinds of, I'm about to be raped clubs. <laughs> now don't misunderstand me. I am definitely not in support of any kind of rape, but we're talking about behavioral phenomena that goes on in the white supremacy system and culture. <gasps> <laughs> See, I've even seen teachers, white adult teachers, start talking about a little nine-year-old. Well, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know what he might do to me. <laughs> I mean, he's a little boy. You see, but this dynamic goes on. But what is underneath that dynamic is when they are asked to describe what is their ideal mate, what do they say? Tall, dark, and handsome. So who is attacking who, okay? Tall, dark, and handsome, and that's why all of their idols, all of their idols, Rudolph Valentino, the Sheik of Araby, that's what they called him, the matinee idol and the lover. He looked 
like a non-white man. Elvis Presley, where people still line up and go to his grave. Why? Because he was a white male with dark hair who could move his hips like a black man and sing like a black man. When the white male dresses up in his finest dress for the most important occasions, he puts on a black tie and tails. Now these are the same tails that they said black men had in the Second World War and the First World War. The white males who went to Europe said to the white ladies, you don't want to have sex with the black man because he, they have tails. Now what they were referring to is the length of the penis in front. Do you follow me? Yeah. But when the white male dresses up, he wants to have this long thing hanging down in the back of him. <laughs> okay? Are you all following me? Okay. We can call this exploring the contradictions of white supremacy. Okay. I guess you have ball games. <laughs> what are the two series of ball games under white supremacy? For you, those of you who know, don't tell, let some new people guess. <laughs> what are the two series of ball games in the white supremacy system and culture? Baseball. Those are C answers. You can't pass the course. Now remember, this is the key. This is the key that you have to keep in mind. The key is male genitalia, and the real key is black male genitalia. The concern of the entire white supremacy system and culture revolves around this issue. Okay, what are these things called? Testicles. <laughs> but you're right, the testicles are also called balls, right? And the culture says what? Keep your eye on the ball. <laughs> now we didn't know, we thought, well watch the baseball as it's coming towards the bat. No, these are the balls. Okay. So I asked the question again, what are the two series of ball games in the white supremacy system and culture? Everybody looks at it, but not being trained. See, we're right now training ourselves to look at the dynamic of white supremacy, understanding it in depth, deep down underneath, so that we have a different perspective of what the surface phenomena is. Understanding the issue in white supremacy, there are two series of ball games, big brown and small white. Oh! All the balls fall under these categories. Let's start on the white side, ping pong, <laughs> Tennis, golf, baseball, that's about it, right? Okay, big brown, football, basketball, <laughs> soccer, bowling ball, <laughs> medicine ball. <laughs> And got some medicine for you. <laughs> okay. Now, what are the balls that the most virile men play with? The big brown. Right. The men that are considered to be most manly play with the big brown balls. Football. Basketball. Right? Now, let's look and see where these balls go. Uh-oh. The football goes into some white upright legs at the end of the field. <laughs> the 
basketball goes into a white net. And then on the side, we have these little white dancing girls in short dresses. Oh. Oh. And hardly a black girl can get on the team, right? These are the ladies who say that their ideal mates are tall, dark, and handsome. Do you follow? They are really playing out before the black men began to dominate, and I said it's no accident that they would dominate the games that had the big brown balls in it, okay? But before they really wanted to let black men play, then white males were playing with these big brown balls, pretending that they were the tall, dark, and handsome persons that the white female said that she liked best. Okay. The small white balls. What is the game that the most powerful white men play? Golf. Golf. And what happens to that little ball? <laughs> <laughs> that little white ball goes into a hole in black mother earth because white men say they're not men until they've had sexual intercourse with a black woman. Do you understand? So there they stand, long stick between legs, trying to put that little white ball in a hole in one. Do you follow? Everything is racism. What are the two series of smoking objects in the white supremacy system and culture? No, come on, I've told you. See, keep this in your mind. Big brown and small white. Big brown, cigars, pipes, and moors, they say they taste better. Small white, cigarettes. <laughs> and what is the slang for cigarettes? Fags. See, consult your dictionary. I don't make any of this stuff up. White men said that the cigarette compared to the cigar was effeminate. Hmm. Do you understand? So what we have is a big dynamic of envy. Envy, okay? The men that are considered to be most powerful smoke what? Cigars. The men that are supposed to be most intelligent smoke pipes. So that at the same time that black people, because right now we have the disease that is killing us of black self-hate, in a culture that really admires black. Do you see, if the man that is supposed to be most intelligent smokes a big black pipe, and the one who is supposed to be most powerful smokes a big black cigar, they are paying tribute to the black people of Africa, and the black men specifically. Do you understand? Just like if somebody is supposed to have knowledge, then you graduate in a black gown and a cap. If you are supposed to know about God, then you wear a black robe. If you are supposed to understand justice, you wear a black robe. At the same time that they have taught us to hate black. Those of us who already have the black mantle of melanin, all right? We have an epidemic of black male on black male homicide with gun. But look at this. This is the issue. If we turn that around, or we're looking at the lateral view, and we turn it around 90 degrees, we see this, and what is that? A gun. And what is the gun called in the white supremacy system and culture? 
the great equalizer. The reason being is that when the white male brain computer looks at the black male and looks at his genitals and realizes that the black male has dominant genetic material in his genitals, that he has genetic material that can cause white genetic annihilation, the white brain computer goes something like this. He has weapon that can annihilate me. <laughs> Must create weapon can do same thing. So he creates the great equalizer. The gun can kill black men because the white supremacy system and culture realized that the black male had genetic material that can cause white genetic annihilation, which is what they consider to be white death. Do you understand? So we go from that to having what? Justifiable homicide. Justifiable homicide is not simply somebody with a gun for self-defense killing somebody else. Very specifically, it is a white male with a uniform and a gun who kills a non-white male and says whether he's 14 or 44, I thought he had a weapon. Well, he does have a weapon. <laughs> but he did not have a knife or gun. But just that very perception that the black male's genitals has the power to cause white genetic annihilation produces the conscious or subconscious attitude of justifiable homicide. You with that, right? Yeah. So I think that it is important, it really is important, I would recommend what you think about it, that we have dialogues instead of, because almost every month, some black male is being killed, whether it's 13 year old somebody or 18 year old somebody, and then the black people get angry and we start fuming and carrying placards. I would say it would be much more effective to hold a press conference and say this is abominable activity, but we understand why it exists. Do you see? And begin to talk about the fear of white genetic annihilation in the thinking of the white collective, okay? Now, when we understand this, we will begin to understand this horrific attack that is on black people in general and black men in particular because it has everything to do with what is happening to us in our families, so-called, in our communities, so-called, and what, in the schools and everywhere. Here's the black male and the black female. You know, we're always talking about black male-female relations and how we have to understand each other more and be sensitive to each other. I maintain the most important thing that we have to understand is the attack of white supremacy. Because white supremacy, with its most fundamental concern for white genetic survival, says that the black male has to be attacked. And that attack comes in the form of unemployment, underemployment. And when that happens, then there's all kind of friction in the so-called black family. Sometimes I prefer to call it a survival unit. Okay? So when this attack comes, if the people are not skilled in an understanding of white supremacy so they can sit down in the kitchen and talk about this is what is happening to us, you are fine and I'm fine, but white supremacy is raising hell with us. And so we must therefore intensify our effort against white supremacy. Do you see what I'm saying? Not go and get some more perfume or bath oil. <laughs> you see why? Because this is a war. This is a war. This is Lebanon. <laughs> 
See, if we understood that this was Lebanon, then everything that is happening would be clear. But as long as we don't want to face the fact that this is war, white supremacy is war against non-white people, most specifically against black non-white people because black people have the highest level of melanin pigmentation production that can most effectively cause white genetic annihilation. So the war is hitting us very heavily at this time. If we don't understand that it's war, we can go round and around and around and around in a circle and never come out in terms of a solution to black male-female relations. For example, and this, you know, we can discuss it, it may be debate. People used to suggest that, well, one black man, since all the black men are being killed, that one black man then have several wives. And I would say that, okay, but I don't see that it works. Because if there's an attack on a male so he cannot support himself, then if he has five wives, then they would end up supporting him, so manhood would be divided by five. If there was not white supremacy, then manhood would be multiplied by five if he could support himself in five wives. Do you understand? But under the conditions of war, if the war is attacking the people in general and the men in particular, then the answer is when the men are disappearing, intensify the war against the enemy. Do you see? And then when the war is over, we can see how many men and women <laughs> link up together. But this is war. This is war. When this war attacks in this way, the white, the black male many times will leave out of pain and frustration. The black female in her pain and frustration is in the house with the children. If she didn't understand white supremacy and was taught about Dick and Jane and Spot and Puff and everybody is equal, <laughs> do you see? Then she's very upset because things haven't worked out the way that she thought at the time that they got married. She's very upset and this frustration and anger is going to hit the male child. And she'll say, there you go acting like that no good father, right? She's not a bad person. The father's not a bad person. They are victims of white supremacy without understanding in depth what is happening. So this attack on the black male child and then he goes to school and the teacher attacks him there. She's frustrated at home, mother's frustrated. So the little male child starts thinking, this is a no-win position. Mother, will you please put some fingernail polish on my nails? Put some curlers in my hair. Let me wear those earrings. And white supremacy is standing on the sidelines cheering. Do you see, because if that is intensified, then the situation will move from passivity to effeminization to bisexuality and homosexuality. And so we now have epidemic levels of bisexuality and homosexuality, not because people are nasty, not because people are bad. White supremacy says this is a war. The ultimate outcome that I'm looking for is genocide. If I produce bisexuality and homosexuality, I will eventually get genocide. That's exactly what I want, because that will allow for white genetic survival. <laughs> or we can go another route. Mothers at home with the children, black male child, black female child, mother's unhappy and depressed, the children are unhappy and depressed, the little boy, somebody says to him, here, I have this, this will make you feel good. And so white supremacy has put the drugs out here, knowing what is happening. So they put the drugs out here, so then he can go to step two. I don't have a job, but I can make money selling drugs. White supremacy said, this is my trap. 
I'm setting them up. Where I really want to is eventually get them in jail. If I have them in jail, then I'll run the South Africa game. In South Africa, the men are in the work camps and the women are in the Bantu stands. And here, the women are in the projects and the men are in jail. They are not together, and so that also amounts to genocide. Do you understand? White supremacy is a gigantic, sophisticated system for white genetic survival. It is not a joke, it is war. We can win a war if we can decode the plays. <laughs> White supremacy also said, if I leave the mother alone, she's overwhelmed, the children won't get a sufficient emotional support, I can produce sex obsession. See how quiet it got? <laughs> Even the breathing stopped. <laughs> See, we're, this, we're making this thing scientific. They're gonna look up and we will have solved this problem. <laughs> Okay, if you deprive children of adequate lap time, you saw the little baby that was up on the stage? That little baby is real cool. You lift it up in the air and it doesn't even make a whimper. That's because that baby has a whole lot of lap time. <laughs> Parents stand up and take praise, okay. But if you don't give children, and it's not because parents are bad, it is because we are under the horrendous stress of war. And if children do not get their emotional needs met, then they are moving around and walking around and something is missing in the area of the solar plexus. And so here's one child and then somebody else next door has the same problem, then they will meet under the porch and have sex, trying to get a sense of human closeness that the white supremacy dynamic deprives us of. For example, if we just go back, what, six, eight generations, we were smack into the slavery phase of white supremacy. The slavery phase of white supremacy was, black lady, you're going to take care of the white baby. Now put that black baby in a box out in the field somewhere. You are nursing the white baby. So nobody was getting their dependency needs met, and that was handed down. Beyond that, white supremacy said, Hattie, I want you to have another baby because I need some more slaves. So Hattie was breeding. That was the old time white supremacy dynamic. The modern white supremacy dynamic is welfare. Hattie, I'll give you a little bit larger welfare check. Just make another baby. I know you cannot take care of them. I know you cannot meet their emotional needs. So whether we're in formal slavery or the modern welfare state, we are going to produce inferiorized people. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because if you pile children one on top of the other, you're going to produce somebody that is vulnerable to drugs, alcohol, white supremacy understands this. You see, white supremacy does studies. The more children you have, the lower the IQ level of the individual child. They know that. But this is about what? White supremacy. And it really is about genocide to a certain extent, but you cannot be superior unless you have people around you who look inferior to you. So you don't get rid of all the people. You just get rid of enough so you don't have a problem, but you want to keep looking at them and say, look at that, look, look at them. Yeah, look, see, I'm superior to that, look at them. Now this is the game that we, what? Have to outsmart. So, what do I propose? Because we are in a giant chess game. And I think that chess is a very excellent analogy to white supremacy, why? Because in chess, the white side always moves first. So that means that they're playing offense, defense, and black has to play catch up, defense, offense, right? But that's okay, because you can win from the black side of the board if you understand the game. So, I propose crest chess. <laughs> that's like laying out the chess board 
for an understanding of white supremacy. So you put white on this side and black on this side, and instead of having eight rows, you try to put nine, so you have economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, I got more, politics, religion, sex, and war. And so this is under sex, if you will. So they make a move, I'm gonna make you make inferiorized people because I can always overwhelm inferiorized people. So on our side of the board, under sex, my recommendation is no black woman have a child before 30, no black man have a child before 35, no more than two, no closer together than three years apart as a strategy for making soldiers. Yeah. See, have some old parents. <laughs> See, that's like you can tell little children who have been reared around their grandparents. There's a difference between somebody who is 14 and somebody who's 34. Make no mistake about it. They would prefer, and this is interesting, this is so interesting to me, after I start talking about this 30, 35, no more than two, no closer together than three years apart, now you know how they have on TV, they bring up the black lady who has 15 children. Hattie, you're on welfare? And you got all these children that you can't take care of? You see what I'm saying? That's Donahue and Sally, Sally, Jesse Raphael, and all the rest of them, okay? So Frances Wilson comes along and says, black people, no more than two, no closer together than three years apart. You would have thought that they would have put me in all the newspapers. What begins to come out in the newspapers? Recent study, we think it's all right for the black teenager to have children that this is an all right solution, this is, no. Do you see what I'm saying? The minute we begin to figure out some plays that'll work, they try to take us back to checkmate. I found that absolutely fascinating. There they were talking about no teenage pregnancy, and the minute we say, yeah, we're gonna adopt that strategy to make soldiers, then they will put in the paper some study that says, oh, it's cool if the children have children. No, it is not cool, okay. It is not cool because somebody who is a child cannot teach emotional maturity. You have to have emotional maturity to fight a war. So that's one strategy, okay. Let's go back to this chess game. Chess, to make a long story short, is about white king, checkmate black king. The reason that I say it is that if white always moves first, it's not sufficient to say that the game of chess is about checkmating the king. White is making the aggressive or the offensive attack. So the game has to be about what? White king checkmating black king, right? So this is the same thing as white genetic survival. The war for white genetic survival. Okay, on this side of the board, they say, well, we have produced people who didn't get enough lap time and we have made them sex obsessed. So now, and then our Secretary of Agriculture, Mr. Butts, already announced all black people want is tight pussy, loose shoes, and a warm place to piss. Is everybody familiar with the fact that he said that? Okay. So they knew that we were sex machines, and even James Brown said, get on up sex machine and we get up, right? Okay. So they know what they're doing. They said, well, now, right, this will be a perfect strategy. We will make a biological warfare weapon that is sexually transmitted. They are so sex obsessed that they'll be saying, I gotta have some, I don't care. I'm not using no condom. Do you all understand? See, they make us and then they make the weapon to destroy what they've made. But then I found out 
through a little book that I found in 1987 that was published in 1969. It was a book done by some people in Britain called A Survey of Chemical and Biological Warfare. And in that book, God led me to the little bookstore, led me to turn immediately upon opening the book to the page that discussed vervet monkey disease. Vervet is Latin for green. You know that green monkey they say was in Africa and started the whole thing? That was a lie. But the vervet monkey disease that this book talked about is described in this way. A disease unlike any other organism, unaffected by any antibiotic substances known, can be a become an infectious disease in man, can be transmitted venereally, that means sexually, candidate for biological warfare. Do you understand? The book was published in 1969. When I mentioned it to people in New York, go to the publisher, get as many copies as you can, I understand that they were told one copy per person, then people had to sign their names to get copies, and now you can't get the book. Do you understand? Warfare, under the eighth area of activity, that's cocaine, crack, marijuana, ice, or whatever they're going to invent next, do you see? Just like under sex and war, they're going to put out a new virus called Ebola, E-B-O-L-A. And we're supposed to believe, oh, this is another virus out of Africa. Oh, just imagine, another monkey is making this virus. Right. Don't you believe it? Every time another virus comes out, you say biological warfare. Just like the Tuskegee syphilis experiment that ran from 1932 to 1972. The Center for Disease Control in Atlanta and the U.S. Public Health Service, the two groups that are now running the AIDS virus campaign, gave black people, meaning allowed black men who were diagnosed as having syphilis, to believe that they were going to a clinic to be treated for syphilis and they were not being treated and so therefore they went home and passed syphilis on to their families. They died of it as well as some members of their family. That went on for 40 years. You see, so if anybody comes, well, are you talking about a conspiracy, Dr. Wilson? <laughs> See, I don't say it's a conspiracy, I just say it's a plan. It's an aspect of the plan for white genetic survival. You see, just like what happened to the Semites of the Jewish religion, a plan for white genetic survival. Why? Because in Europe, the Semites of the Jewish religion were considered to be not white people. They were considered, the word Semite comes from the Latin prefix semi, which means half, half what? Half black and half white. This was a population of people made on the northern tier of Africa of the combination of Greek and Roman soldiers and black women in Africa. So 2,000 years ago, when the Malacos over there were made, then some of them went up in Europe with the definition that a Jew is anybody whose mother is a Jew. So that meant that the woman could have sex with any white man hoping that the children will be lighter and lighter. We know about that, right? There are people that plan, well, if I have sex with a white man, then the child will be light and the child will have a better chance. That's the same thing that they were doing, trying to get blonde hair, blue-eyed people with more European-type features and straighter hair. But 2,000 years later, Adolf Hitler came along and said, wait a minute. You all are about to participate in causing us to have genetic annihilation. So we're going to kill you. We're going to kill 11 million of you. They succeeded in killing 6 million. I recommend for everybody go to your video store and get a video of the Wan C 
W-A-N-N-S-E-E, Juan C. Conference. It's a German docudrama that describes the government sitting down and planning carefully how they were going to kill 11 million people. They succeeded in killing six because they were not considered to be white. Now, because somebody looks white to us, does not mean that white people are thinking of them as white. I was just in New Orleans and talking to the people there about, because there was a lady in New Orleans, a black lady who was so light that she could pass for white. So she said, why should I be black? I'm gonna go to the court and get my classification changed. And the court said, I'm sorry, ma'am, you're gonna have to stay black. <laughs> why? Because if you are carrying even little bits of African genetic material, over time, all those little bits will begin to add up and the population will experience white genetic annihilation. Are you with me? So I say that we need to get very sophisticated and understand what that dynamic was all about and not waste our time attacking other people that the system says are not white. Because very interestingly, white supremacy dropped the atomic bomb on the Japanese, right? Second World War, Japanese-speaking non-white people. The, they reached the 1980s and 90, and they have all kinds of anti-black literature and anti-Semite. The Semites of the Jewish religion lost six million. That was one third of their total world population. They're busy yelling about Jesse Jackson and Farrakhan, having said nothing to the Nazis. Do you understand? So these are, this is fear. The Japanese speaking non-white people want to embrace white people and want to be accepted by white people, but white people drop the bomb on them. The Semites of the Jewish religion were killed by the white people with the cooperation of the European powers and the government over here. But they want to still embrace and be accepted. So they spend their time attacking non-white people and the Japanese spend their time attacking non-white people and hoping that everybody will be classified as honorary whites. Do you follow me? Because everybody is afraid to look at the white side of the chessboard and even talk about white supremacy. Why? Because we are all afraid. Are you all with me? <laughs> we are not going to make any progress. I don't care what any of the people who are classified as non-white are doing. They are not the enemy. Now this lesson needs to be taught in South Africa, all over Africa, all over this area of the world. What are we doing with our frustration and anger? Killing one another. White supremacy said we're going to run a real fast game on them in South Africa. Now they've been pleading to let Mr. Mandela out. So they say now, well we're going to run on these people is we're going to smile at them. And we're going to let Mr. Mandela out. In the meantime, we are going to arm different groups of them. And since we have spent so much time teaching them to hate black and to love white, that once we put these weapons in their hands, then they will kill one another. And we'll just lay back and say, we can't give one man one vote to that. Do you understand? Same here. White supremacy functions with a minority controlling a majority by dividing and conquering. If the non-white people on the planet did not fight each other, white supremacy would stop tomorrow. Do you follow what I'm saying? So these are very important, very important lessons 
Oh, I see. You all, this after midnight. Very important lesson that non-white people have to master. We have to leave each other alone. That's like black men and women. Leave each other alone. See, because what we do, being afraid to face this side of the chessboard, we dump our frustration and anger on this square attacking this square, or this piece attack that piece. Do you see, and we have the illusion that we are into something and solving something. The only way that we're going to solve something is to direct our attention at white supremacy, even if we have to sit and look at it and say we're afraid. Well, you're afraid, so what are, we going, what are you going to do? Well, we don't know. We are not going to do anything because we're afraid right now. If we get over the fear, we're going to start looking in this direction. But this is absolutely critical. Absolutely critical. Don't get on any TV programs arguing with other black people. See, because that's the game that they play. Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you're gonna come on and talk about racism. I know that I'll make you all fight and then the white people just lay back in the cut and just look from side to side as we're hitting each other. Racism goes on discussed while we are battling it out with each other. So all of these little games, it's just like racism goes on, the black man and the black woman are fighting each other. The black male against the black male, the black female against the black female, squabbling and arguing, my sorority is better than yours. My fraternity is better than yours. My church is better than yours. My tribe is better than yours. My club, you all understand. Yeah. <laughs> My car is better than yours. It'll run faster. It costs more. You see, all these little things that we get all caught up in as though it means something so we don't have to look at white supremacy. And this is the fuel that keeps white supremacy moving because figure, fewer than one-tenth of the people on the planet, how can they hold down all of the people? No, they have to make armies of the non-white people who are willing to fight and kill and name call and focus on one another. And they can do that day in and day out and day out and day in. So I say that our responsibility for the 1990s and moving into the year 2000, that we have to understand white supremacy, what it is, but then we have to go to this level and begin to deal with the behaviors and the activity in the area of black self-hate or non-white people self-hate all over the world. The people in India, you're light and I'm dark. You see, and so we're gonna be in different casts and my cast is better than your cast. We've got the same foolishness going on here. White supremacy set it up. That's why white supremacy will move amongst black people the white male will have sexual intercourse or rape the black female and start making a whole lot of lighter colors. Then telling the lighter colors that you're closer to white and so you're better. And so now you all squabble and fight. These are tricks of white supremacy. So South Africa says, well, we have a colored population. See, and if white supremacy gets real swift, They'll start lining up the people based on color and say, well, you actually, our anthropological studies tell us that you're not quite black. And so you can reclassify into group K1324. You, you see what I'm saying? They'll run that. You will have a better chance to get a job. Your job will not be taken by the Eastern Europeans who come over here. Do you all understand? Any little play, we have to say, oh, no, we're not interested in that trick. 
We know what that trick is. We are not going to fall victim to these white supremacy plays. I don't know whether to stop or to go on. <laughs> <laughs> See, but what we are trying to do, what we are trying to do is move on up this pyramid and become pyramid builders, but we are right here in the middle, right? At this very critical layer. But if we decide if every individual black person if every individual person of African descent, since we are the mothers and fathers of all of the people on the planet, and so we should be the ones who say, we'll lead the way. We're gonna show all of the non-white world how to bring justice to the planet. And so we don't have to join any club, but we will start engaging in these exercises of not name calling one another, not squabbling with one another, cursing one another, being discourteous and disrespectful, not fighting one another, not killing one another, not throwing down trash, not having children think they can be parents. We can lead the way so that all the other non-white people, well, we might as well follow our black parents. See, we might as well let them lead us to justice. And then this thing up here, this all-seeing eye, I believe that that is going to open up and begin to give us the power that we need to finish off the injustice and the evil of white supremacy. Now, I'm not talking about killing white people. That's not necessary. Because here on this planet, that tiny minority of people, fewer than one-tenth of the people on the planet, that they now have overwhelming power because the non-white people are neutralizing one another. But the, if the non-white people start focusing in on white supremacy, then they will surround it with their eyes, and it won't be able to move. Can you see that if everybody is focusing and looking at white supremacy, it'll be just like a grandparent casting that eye on you and you've got to shape your behavior up. Do you understand? They won't be able to make a devilish move. You see, but if you follow the media, the media is saying, now, black ladies, you don't really need a black man. The end thing is a white man. Just like the media is saying to black men now, look, we've come a long way. This is in. Every black man can have a white female. You see, but then the counter racists and the people who are interested in establishing justice will come along and say no sexual intercourse with any person who classifies themselves as white. Until such time that white supremacy is eliminated on the entire planet. Now, if you think that that doesn't mean something, I gave a talk some time ago at Washington State University in Yakima. And it was a large white audience. And so Neely Fuller had put this in his book, The Textbook for Victims of White Supremacy. He said, Francis, you can experiment. Just try, just say that one time and watch what happens. <laughs> so I suggested that. And two white gentlemen in the audience jumped up and, no, 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 we can't have that. I said, no sexual intercourse between black ladies and white men until white supremacy is eliminated on the planet. Mm. <laughs> and they jumped up and were about to have a stroke. Ladies, that might be our most potent weapon. 
Like I was just telling Sister Keffa, a young lady that I know, she's 26 years old and she's in law school. And she came and showed me her $10,000 diamond ring. Now what is significant about the ring, it was a big beautiful ring, but she was saying, Dr. Welsing, I do not believe in sexual intercourse until after marriage. Now, while some people are saying, you can't, you can't have any boyfriend like that, this young lady, 26 years old, has never had sexual intercourse and has a $10,000 diamond ring and an engagement that is going to last two more years. Now, brothers, don't get upset with me. <laughs> but see, we're trying to build a pyramid here. I mean, if things get good, the brothers will say, you are really beautiful. You're the finest thing. But I'm in school trying to become a soldier. I'm a warrior for justice. And then the people will start saying, uh-oh, we are in trouble. What is wrong with our black monkeys? <laughs> Think of all the money we spent to get them in that shape. All of the years, and you mean they are breaking rank and breaking training? Where are they? The library is overflowing. They're not shaking their booties. The booty is on the chair in the library. They're flooding the libraries. They're stacking books up in their homes. They're teaching their children to read. Their children are passing all the spelling bees, nationally and internationally. My God, they're in the physics institutes. Engineering. Agriculture, mathematics. Oh my God, we've got a problem here. Do you all understand? <laughs> we are going to change this world. I mean, don't you all hear the ancestors saying you all have everything to work with? God made you the first people. He gave you everything to work with. And so you all are not going to get your blessings until you really rise to the occasion and bring justice back to this planet. Now that's what I hear, that's what I hear. You know, every time we say club or sorority, we ought to be saying army. Yeah. 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 We should all be talking to each other about assignments. Yeah. Yeah. What is your assignment, Francis? Yeah. Are you on your assignment? Nothing is more important than the army of justice and our individual assignments. Now we can have some material things, 
no problem. As a matter of fact, we should give up the concept of being poor. Yeah. <laughs> Poverty. Do you understand? See, we've got that poor, poor, dilapidated, falling apart. We should have in our minds wealth. <laughs> Serious. Money so that we can do whatever we need to do to bring about justice. I was reading a book about the subconscious mind and putting material in the subconscious mind. You know, going home and relaxing and seeing yourself have everything that you want and achieving everything that you want. Now, this is theory. I believe that the people with melanin have the greatest potential for visualizing with the third eye. What's that young man's name who can fly? Jordan? <laughs> and all those other young men that say they visualize the move, right? So we're going to go home and we're going to visualize justice. Do you see, we're going to stop talking about, oh, it's so hard, we can't, I don't think we can do it. We're going to have armies of visualizers, armies of readers, and we are going to bring justice to this planet. Now, you know how some other people gave themselves 10 years to get to the moon? While we said, oh, no, no. You, can, you can't go to the moon. They visualized it and went to the moon. It's like we say, well, we are a so-called minority. They are a minority. They visualized what they considered to be their survival necessity. Now, we are going to visualize justice because that is our necessity. If everybody goes home and begins to visualize and every time can't comes into your brain computer, don't curse yourself out. Just say, wait a minute, back up, and then say can. Removing all of these negatives. If you hear your brain computer calling you a name, say, wait, back up, back up. Lieutenant in the Army of Justice. On assignment, no negative names apply. Do you understand? Yeah. We can reprogram ourselves and we must and we will. Okay? See, it is wonderful to hook up in relationships but as long as white supremacy is saying you can't have any permanent relationship unless you smash me. So what is our answer? Well, I guess that's what we'll have to do. Right? And we're going to have this upside down pyramid of white supremacy you see that has white genetic survival as its necessity. And so this pyramid of evil and injustice is being opposed by this pyramid for justice. That base is going to be truth. Do you all understand? And black men and black women 
are going to produce this power. Yes. And we're going to get it done in the shortest possible time that we can possibly get it done. Is everybody going to sign up? Yes. Now let me tell you all about motherfuckers so that you can see. The original one. <laughs> see, everything is related to white supremacy. One time I I was I was someplace in DC. I was standing outside and some a group of black teenagers passed. They were motherfucker, motherfucker. Motherfucker, mother, motherfucker. So I said, this must mean something. <laughs> That's really how I came upon the ball games because it was so quiet one Sunday. It was so quiet and you can really think when it's quiet, which is why they encourage us to have a whole lot of noise because the brain hums when it's quiet. So I said, ooh, it's so quiet and nice. Something must be going on. And then it clicked, the ball games. And so that's how I said, oh, they've got to mean something more than just at the surface what we thought. So I heard this so many times, and I said, this has got to mean something. This is language that occurs within the context of a system of white supremacy, a system for white genetic survival. So I said, in some way, this use of language is related to this power system. And so then I thought, there are five people categories, man, woman, boy, girl, baby. And so under white supremacy, who is the man? The man, that's the isolating article. That means the only one. So when we say the man, I didn't say here comes a man. That could be my dad or somebody. We say the man, that means the white man, right? So man is out. Under white supremacy, black men fought historically. Don't call me no boy, right? Black men died gave their lives, don't call me no boy. White supremacy said, cool, you got three choices. <laughs> woman, girl, or baby. I say until recently, woman and girl was out. <laughs> <laughs> but baby was in. Hey baby, <laughs> how many black women have called a black man baby? Tell the truth. I said, in your time, <laughs> not now. <laughs> How many black men have called a black woman mama? Hey, mama, can I ride with you? Tell the truth and get free. Right, 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 right. How many black men have called a place where they sleep a crib? Okay, watch out. So the brain computer says, man who calls another man the man, calls himself baby, calls the woman he sleeps with mama, calls the place where he sleeps a crib, will call himself what? Shall we go over it again? <laughs> man who calls another man the man, calls himself baby, calls the woman he sleeps with mama, calls the place where he sleeps a crib, will call himself a motherfucker. Now, don't get upset. <laughs> I wrote a paper called The Motherfucker and the Original Motherfucker. <laughs> what I reasoned was, I reasoned that if black men stumbled across this symbolic phrase, because what? A baby compared to a man is what? Powerless. Right, you all? 
You see, if this language would never have happened, if when somebody says, hey, what's happening? If instead of people saying, everything's cool, which is a lie, because everything is hot under white supremacy. See, just like the Cold War has ended, that was white people fighting each other. The hot war continues. That's white against non-white, right? OK. So that if people said everything is not cool, the white man is still in charge, meaning the white collective, then motherfucker would never have come into being. But if people say everything is cool, then the brain is forced to deal with reality. So I said for black men to stumble across this phrase to mean powerless, there had to be another powerless motherfucker on the scene. So who is it? Okay. How so? Okay. The paleontologists and anthropologists are telling us human life began in Africa, right? The mothers and fathers of everybody were black men and women. Okay, so we're the parents of the white people, as quiet as it's kept, okay? So when the white male has sexual intercourse with the black woman, he is symbolically having sexual intercourse with who? His mother. And when he has sexual intercourse with the black woman, she proves that she is genetically more powerful than he, so he feels genetically powerless. And so because he feels genetically powerless, then he imposes political powerlessness on the black male. Do you all follow? Yeah. See, now that's how come white men can't say, they can't say motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> See, now if black men were to go on a job and say, hey, you know why we say motherfucker, Bill? <laughs> You always wanted to know, how come you all say that all the time? Say, because your genetic powerlessness imposed political powerlessness on us. Now, my mother called me up and she said, Francis, <laughs> I heard that you said that phrase in public. And I said, Mother, what are you talking about? And my mother has, to this day, she will never say it. So she said, Marilyn Farmer. <laughs> so I told her, don't worry, Mama, it is a political expression. See, it is a way that we have of saying powerless without facing the real reality. But somebody said, Satchmo said, somebody said, say what's happening, and he said, the white man is still in charge. Now, if we start dealing with that, which is just like somebody saying, did you win the last chess tournament? We say, no, we haven't won a chess tournament in a long time. Well, you all must be stupid. Well, maybe, maybe, but you just keep playing. And we're just going to keep watching the game. And I think we're going to begin to do OK. Do you see? So yeah, we lost the tournament. No problem. We didn't have an appropriate analysis, no problem. Now we got an analysis, and if we get enough people talking about the analysis, then we'll just see what's going to happen on this planet. Do you understand what I'm saying? We need to say, yes, there's a war at the same time that we are being as polite as we can possibly be to people who classify themselves as white. See, I'm not advocating honky honk. No, that's over. See, that's what we did in the 60s. <laughs> so no, this time round, <laughs> we're coming with an analysis. And we say, you know, this is what we think the problem is. Well, how can we help? See, any person who classifies themselves as white, if they want to help, here's a suggestion. First of all, you tell them, don't have any sexual intercourse <laughs> with a non-white person. <laughs> See, 
See, we could then tell them, Neely Fuller says, don't have any children because right now you're just feeding into the system of white supremacy. <laughs> okay. But if we suggest, please just bring us a syllabus of what you talk about when there's no black people around. <laughs> See, that'll help us tremendously. <laughs> I was talking to Neely Fuller the other day. He said, you can tell a white person, just guide me through and show me how to get that loan at the bank. <laughs> you can even hold my hand and just show me. Now, this is step one. And then next you do this. And next you do this. Do you see what I'm saying? That's important information. Now, if they're not willing to guide you through, <laughs> then you say, well, no problem. There was only one John Brown. <laughs> <laughs> and so you say, I'll see you later. I'm going to the library. <laughs> Well, I thought you were going to the club. No, I'm going to the library. <laughs> See, you didn't show me how, so I have to try to read up on it. I know you got it in one of those books. Okay? Very important. No black men calling ladies bitches. What? That helps all of us because that would mean if I call a black lady a bitch and I'm a male, B-I-T-C, then I'm calling myself a dog because my mother gave birth to me. Do you understand? No black lady saying, I can't stand black men. Why? Because a black man and a black woman are responsible for me being on this planet. If I hate black men, my self-respect score can only be 50. 50% 50 and that is not passing. Okay? Same the other way. But black man, I can't stand black women. Then his self-respect score is 50% at best, and that's not passing. So we have to understand why we have so many problems with each other. Because the war has taught us to hate ourselves and therefore to hate one another. And that's what this dynamic is all about. So we just have to say, wait a minute, if we can't get along mutually and harmoniously, then we'll just get on our skateboard and go to the next person. You're fine and I'm fine. Mm -hmm. But we're going to stop all of this squabbling and wasted energy that is preventing us from winning this war for justice. Okay? What else? Let me let you all ask some questions as we move into the morning hours. <laughs> yes. Uh, competition, brother, and cooperation, especially in the workplace where there's so much competition amongst the blacks to get the favor, whatever. Oh, Lord Jesus, yes. Competition with one another in the workplace. See, white supremacy says there's just a few little crumbs that I'm going to dribble out here. And my basic thing in relationship to non-white people is to keep them fighting each other so white supremacy reigns supreme. 
You see, so white supremacy pays off for one black person bringing gossip about another to a white person in the workplace. Do you see? And so Neely Fuller put down in the 10 stops, stop snitching on one another. Maybe I didn't bring for reasons of personal gain. See, we have to understand that and at the same time that a person is victim of that activity, you've got a struggle inside of yourself to keep your focus on the white side of the chessboard. It's very hard, I can tell you personally. Black people attacking other black people. Do you see, because somebody sitting behind a frosted glass, the gloved white hand of white supremacy, is saying, if you do that to that black person, I will give you a promotion and move you up. Do you see? That we have to not turn on the black person, although that's very hard, because we can kill each other, okay? But to look at white supremacy and hold white supremacy responsible, okay? Like I used to say a long time ago, if a black man would rape me, that would hurt me to my soul. But I would hope that I would have the sanity to say, who caused him to be like that? And charge that side of the chessboard with two strikes. What happened to him and what happened to me? Do you see, now that's horrible. Don't misunderstand me. But that is taking it where the responsibility lies. Because, for example, if you have a bully on a playground and that bully sends child A to hit child B, if you just get child A, by that time, bully has sent child C to hit child D. And so what you do is get the bully the person that is causing the problem. This is who you stop. So when we zero in on stopping white supremacy and labeling it and diagnosing it and talking about it, we're stopping the source of the problem. Because as long as you leave the bully out here, he can infect K and W, and W will hurt X, and then Y, do you see what I'm saying? So you have to what? you have to stop the bully. And a lot of stopping the bully has to do with simple exposure. Say, no, we understand how white supremacy operates. It operates based on divide and conquer. We're gonna hold white supremacy responsible. Any other? Yes, sir. of the same thing. Have some black person write a musical called Arms Too Short to Box with God. That means what? Your arm is too short to box with white supremacy. You see, now the way that we get rid of it is not going and attacking some black person who goes to a church when there's a white Jesus. The way you go about it is Stop name calling, stop being discourteous. You see, because if you're moving around doing that, some black person who goes to a church that has a white Jesus will say, who was that nice person? That was a black person who spoke to me so courteously. That was a magnificent feeling. That was a, that was a black person who spoke to me like that. Do you see, then we will change our attitudes based on how we think about ourselves and how we relate to the reflections of ourselves, which is one another, okay? Because we can't choke each other and eliminate white supremacy. Yes? How does the so-called UCLPCU affect our war in the struggle that we engage in The so-called what in Eastern Europe? Unity. Well, what is the unity in Eastern Europe? They're just talking about a unity that they've always had. <laughs> See, they're just talking more about it because the planet is changing. The non-white people are flexing and turning and moving in Asia and Africa. And even us over here, we're flexing and turning. And white supremacy said they're getting ready to be the majority over here. So these little squabbles 
that we've had with each other pretending I'm a capitalist and I'm a communist as opposed to I practice white supremacy economics. Okay. okay. And so they're just tightening their formation up. Do you see what I'm saying? Making sure that they don't break rank and they say, well, the resources, it's just enough for us. And so we can't be giving these black people over here jobs because some of these people over here need to come over here and get jobs and get out of those food lines. Do you see? So if they tighten up and we say, ha ha, they're tightening up and guess what? We're tightening up. See how the vibe dropped. <laughs> And I know what that vibe was. The vibe just dropped when I said, we're tightening up. And you know what it is? It's the fear of being by ourselves. See, the vibe dropped again. Can't you all feel that? I mean, like, it's about to get real cold in here. <laughs> you know? You mean we're not going to have any white people with us? <laughs> Do you all understand? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> you, you mean it's not going to be any more integrated neighborhoods? <laughs> no, it's just going to be us. <laughs> But see, what if, if we were over here engaging in this, all these things, no throwing down trash where black people live, work, and play, only four uses of time, constructive conversation, constructive activity, that means sweeping the dirt and making the lawn look nice and painting the house. And so people will drive through, Say, there used to be glass all over this street. They've cleaned this neighborhood out. There's no black people here. <laughs> Where are the orange peels? Where are the broken soda bottles? And then they see a black person come. Oh, that black person must work there. No, I think they live there. They got something else moving here. They don't think they're trash anymore. You know, we had them thinking that they were trash so they would get real comfortable when we compacted them and burned them because you know that is what you do with trash. And anybody who lives around trash thinks of themselves as trash. So they've broken training here and they are not trying to get in our neighborhoods. <laughs> You know, we had them wasting a whole lot of energy trying to get wherever we ran next. <laughs> They're not trying to get in our schools. I understand that they have the highest reading scores in the world. <laughs> oh my God. What's that next chemical that we had? <laughs> See, but by then, all of our people are in the laboratories and studying and they're chemists and they're engineers and so anything they make, we've already made the antidote. Okay. So where was I? Next. <laughs> yes, okay. To, that's why it's very important to make an analysis of what the problem is based on what you said that they are the most powerful people in the world nobody could have destroyed one-third of their world population so I say that's not true if somebody can come in and destroy you you are not powerful do you understand what I'm saying but I say this diversionary 
Just like in a football game, the real person who has the ball, you say, don't look at him, look over there. Now that's the trick. You see, we have to try to get courageous and look at white supremacy. See, white supremacy put those yellow stars on them. Just like Time Magazine put that yellow stripe and said, this is not white. You see what I'm saying? So that's the way that I look at it, it would be diversionary for us to focus on people who have been classified as white by white supremacy. White supremacy, you know, the Semites of the Jewish religion say they're God's chosen people. And so they kind of debate with each other about what they were chosen to do, so I get into the discussion. <laughs> and I say they were chosen to show all of the non-white people on the planet, no matter how light skin you get, no matter if you cut off your nose and straighten your hair, no matter how many degrees you get, no matter how many diamond rings you get, no matter if you produce a Marx and a Freud and a Rubenstein, that when the hammer of white supremacy comes down, that white supremacy will have the power to say, you don't need that fur coat where you're going. You don't need that degree where you're going. Now that's what happened to the Semites of the Jewish religion. Do you see what I'm saying? If we get that straight, do you see, because, you know, I can tell you by the time you get back to your room in this hotel or wherever you're going, somebody will think, you know what I should have told Dr. Wesley? I didn't tell her about those people that live down the block from me. They're, black people are doing more harm to other black people than any white. Now see, what that means I can't focus on white supremacy because my brain has already figured out. See, because white people say, don't even look at me. Now you look at me and you won't keep your job. You see, so that's why we keep needing these diversionaries. Well, what about the Chinese? Don't you remember now, those Chinese people, they were rioting against the Africans. We kill each other. The issue is to look at white supremacy. See, that is the challenge. Look at white supremacy. Don't look at your sister who you hate. Don't look at your cousin who you can't stand. Don't get mad at your parents. We are all victims of white supremacy, so we are likely to do anything. The problem that has created all of that insanity of behavior is white supremacy for the purpose of white genetic survival. Now that is, to me, the challenge for us, you see to stop anybody that somebody can come along and put in a truck and line up and kill, you believe me, they don't have any power. You see, or say, no, you go over here. Now, you want to be white so bad, I'm going to put you in the Middle East and let you kill your Palestinian cousin. You see, just like the black people that they line up and give guns to in South Africa and say, you kill each other. Okay? Or you kill each other in Washington, D.C. You all kill each other. Kill each other in Detroit. Right. Kill each other. Here are the guns. You kill each other. Okay? The answer is to look at white supremacy. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. I'd like to know in reference to uh, the project, the genome project, the uh, genetic mapping of the body, how does that play in this? Uh, I said in the Crest Theory, that white supremacy has, has an obsessive focus on color, genetics, and sex. Do you see, so they're focusing on, you know, they're playing with changing genes and everything, and they will do anything for the purpose of white genetic survival. So if we settle down and really get serious and start going to the library, we'll say, now they're probably going to do this, and they'll probably do this, 
and they'll probably do this, so they probably would like to get the gene types on everybody, and then they will go in their laboratory and figure out, now we've got this percentage of them that have this particular gene pattern and this particular subtlety of this gene pattern, and I think that we'll be able to make something else, because I think they may be getting onto AIDS, and so we're going to have to make something else for the purpose of white genetic survival. Now, if we know that, see, if we come out of this thing of needing white people to like us, okay. <laughs> you know? See, and that's why we have to practice these behaviors so we start liking ourselves. So that's just like an individual. If I like myself, I don't have to go around begging other people to like me. It doesn't mean I hate them, but I don't, would you please like me? Please, please want to live next to me. Please, please invite me to dinner. Please go to the restaurant with me. Please. <laughs> See, I mean, this is what we have to, if we get out of that, then it'll be just like sitting at the chessboard or playing football. You're just studying the plays that are made by the other team. You're not begging or pleading or blinding yourself because you need somebody to like you. Do you see, you just get into an analysis, hey, I saw you make that play. I know exactly what you're getting ready to do now. Check. <laughs> do you see? So they'll, you know, they'll do anything that will allow for white genetic survival, and I mean anything. For example, there's a movie out called The Handmaiden's Tale. Now, a part of the movie, I didn't see it yet, but a part of the movie is supposed to be about white women breeding. Do you see? Because their birth rate is going down, so you've got some that are breeding, sort of like in Nazi Germany. The other dimension of the movie that is not really focused on is that they are taking black people to a toxic waste dump. Now see, things are laid out in movies to prepare, get the mind prepared. <laughs> Do you see, as long as, oh, that's just a movie. Right. Hey, we're all Americans and this is just entertainment. It's nothing that is just entertainment. That's like there's nothing that is just religion. There's nothing that is just war. There is war under white supremacy, religion under white supremacy, politics under white supremacy, labor under white supremacy, law under white supremacy, education under white supremacy. Do you see? It's just like black people say, no, we want to learn about ancient African history. No, we can't have that. <laughs> you see? And so I say, instead of walking around with pickets, save your energy, go to the library. Yeah. Do you see? relating to ourselves and one another. See, the best measure of what I feel about myself is how I relate to the reflection of myself. Do you see, like, let's say if a lady says, Dr. Wilson, I love my husband, how do you treat him? Do you see, or a man says, I love my wife, how do you treat her? And so if I really have respect for myself, it is reflected in what I do to the reflection of myself, which is another black person. But if we begin to engage in these behaviors, we will feel better about ourselves. Self-respect will be enhanced. We can stop lying to ourselves. And also to understand critically, if you do not respect yourself to a sufficient degree, you will not defend yourself. Now, 
Speaking about Semites of the Jewish religion, Bruno Bettelheim, who was a Semite of the Jewish religion, a psychoanalyst who just died. He was in his 90s. And I read an interview that was in a paper. He said the Jewish people did not dis get destroyed because they lacked courage. They were destroyed because they did not respect themselves. See, they didn't want to be. I'm German. That's us. I'm American. I didn't leave anything in Africa. <laughs> See, it's just like what we have to do now. We know what white supremacy is and learn about how. Now we're going to have to jump on symptom number one the disease that it has caused within ourselves. You see what I'm saying? That hating, I don't want to be black. I don't want to be black. You know? I don't want any crystal black baby. I don't want. You know? See, we have to really understand. I mean, this stuff is deep. You see, but it's like even if we look in the mirror and say, I know I hate my black self, <laughs> but I'm going to embrace myself. <laughs> and I'm going to embrace myself and love myself and respect myself even while I'm hating being black. I'm going to embrace myself and not call myself names because I will to change. Do you see, that's what we have to do to ourselves and do to one another. This is deep. And we have to get it out of our pores. Do you see? Because if we begin to really love crystal black, we might be able to make some lasers with crystal black. <laughs> and have some Star Wars of our own, okay? Okay? So we do, we have to, you know, know about the behaviors of self-hate and at the same time we have them try to respect it and then this will to every day do some few exercises. I really wanted to talk to my friend, but I know I was going to gossip and I didn't have anything else constructive to say. So I didn't call her. <laughs> I mean, that's a real struggle. See, if I can't gossip my tongue, <laughs> it doesn't really want to work. I mean, it's a real struggle to not engage in those behaviors that are crucifying of one another because we are going to be victorious. So self-esteem is important. Somebody else have their hand up? Yes. Go ahead. You know what, if I told you all a dirty joke tonight, I could, if I could remember one, but I could tell you a dirty joke, and guess where? It would be in California by Monday. That's right. That means that we would pass it on. I could teach a new dance step and say, you all, have you seen this latest dance step? That's right. This is the way they do it. And so I show you, and then you say, I didn't quite get it, but I think this is the way. And then I teach my cousin, and I teach the person down the block, and the dance would move all over the black community. Right. Now I'm saying, everything that we've talked about here tonight, if any of it means anything to you, pass it on. Like the African proverb says, each one teach one. 
See, even if somebody just remembered, stop gossiping about one another. That's right. Somebody else might remember, don't throw down any trash where black people live, work, and play. Somebody else might remember, everybody get a PhD in broom. <laughs> Learn how to move that broom where black people live. So it's no glass, no dirt, no paper, no boxes, no hamburger wrappers. Do you see that if people just started doing that, somebody say, what's, what's that brother doing? What's that brother doing with that broom? What, what is he doing? So that man has the highest level of self-respect apparently in the block. <laughs> Do you see? I mean, if we start doing that, we can create a revolution just by word of mouth. You know, the young people in Public Enemy, I got a call from a magazine in New York, and they said, uh, do you know Public Enemy, Dr. Wells? And I said, I'm really sorry. I don't know the pop culture that well. I have to confess. They said, well, they based their new record, Fear of the Black Planet, on the Crest Theory. <laughs> So, you know, I say that's nice, but what? The idea that they are talking about. So all of us can do that. We could change this planet by deciding. I mean, we have the power to each one teach. We talk all the time. We sing all the time. It's only a question of what do we talk about and what do we sing about. We could sing about Super Freak. <laughs> We can sing about nasty, or we can sing about justice. You see, so it depends on what we understand and what we decide to push when we relate to one another. Yes. You know when they were pushing that flu vaccine and they had all these black people on television trying to convince other black people and it's like I got a, see I get a, a little signal right here in my solar plexus if it's wrong. And so the only thing I can say is tune in up above and then see what kind of communication you get as to what it is because just like you, I'm a physician, but when they start, you know, doing all this excited talk about this vaccination and this one, that it worries me when I understand white supremacy, but I can't tell you, you, understand, you see what I'm saying? That you just have to tune in and let your intuition and your self-respect speak to you and, re and see what you come up with. You see, but if we communicate it, if we communicate it instead of foolishness and gossip, and what did you, did you see what she had on? What kind of car does he think he has? You see, like if we give up that kind of discussion, and everybody is reading and everybody is listening because black people work all kinds of places. And so what you hear is you decide to share it or what you read you decide to share it and then we'll come up, you see, by people passing information along in that way, we will come up with those things that protect us. And when you start respecting yourself and look in the mirror and say, I love my black self, That's right. then your brain begins to pick up information that is harmful to you. You see, just like in, in, uh, in Germany, there were some Semites of the Jewish religion who had got some reports, hey, I think they're taking us away and killing us. <laughs> and something, what are you talking about? They wouldn't do anything like that to us. We're Germans. Good teaching. You see, so one person was vibing to some self-respect and somebody else was vibing to 
I want to be white. Do you see? But if we vibe to let me respect myself, let me respect this creation of God, and then let me look at this newspaper or tune into the TV and see what they're saying. And if my brain computer says, watch it, Francis. Watch it. You better tell other people, watch it. Then that's what you do. Okay? Yes. Yes. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Can I comment on what? You mean the sugar is... say because I'm not familiar with that. Mm -hmm. See, this is why people have to read. Everybody has to read. No one person does all the reading. But see, don't make the biggest thing that you do fear. Make the most important thing that you do, how can we strengthen this army? Do you see, how can we go on the offensive by countering within ourselves negative behavior. Do you see, because we could just be, oh, 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 they might be doing something, they might be doing something, oh, 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 and then I just faint, okay. But if we say no, we have a major game plan for strengthening our self-respect, strengthening our self-esteem, so that we become soldiers and then we are prepared in, by whatever we must do do you see, if indeed we find out that this is happening, this is happening, or this is happening. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So, but what you're saying is important, and I just encourage everybody to read, get the reference. I'll get the reference, and we'll read, and we'll find out. Yes. See, I just have a, a suggestion, and I would suggest that while we're here now, that if everybody here, we come from all parts of the United States. Mm -hmm. Find out who is here from your state. Create communication with them so when you go back home, you can establish some type of action core group. See, because a lot of times we go through a thing and we get pumped up, and once we get back home, you got to wait till next year. And I'm not saying that some people might already be doing that. But if you're not doing it, you establish these groups in your own state. So you can carry this thing on a daily basis, <laughs> you know, establish, I mean, action groups. So you can have an organized way that you can get to the people. Well, see, again, think about what we do on an individual basis passing a joke. 
or passing a dance step, if we would adopt that same methodology, if you hear something, share it with another person. You see, because people could begin to get bogged down, another meeting, another group, and then they fall into dysfunction. If they understand if you have information, because think of all the telephone calls that black people make. But think about what is being transmitted in those telephone calls. And then, I mean, we have a constant network, ask AT&T. <laughs> See, we are constantly talking to each other. It's only a question of what it is that we talk about. And so I'm suggesting simply that we change, keep on talking, but change the quality of what it is that we're talking about instead of it gossiping that is always destructive. Turn it into information. Talk and say, did you hear anything about phenylalanine or so and so and so or whatever, whatever. That's the kind of way that we can share. And if we simply do stay on that telephone, but what is it that we are sharing with one another? And tell the person that you call. When you call so and so, share that with them. And then that becomes a massive dynamic that can get very critical information around. Yes. Well, the camp was in Oregon, and 5,000 black homeless people, men, were taken out there from different major centers. The camp is closed. The black men never came back. Well, everybody knows about Jonestown. That was 1,000 dead people. We didn't care about that. 22 dead children in Atlanta. We let some black male be blamed for it. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Now, one thing, I mean, it's like you have to read everything. And white supremacy is not as fancy as sometimes it appears to be. In Germany, what they did is they had a concentration camp and they made it look really nice on the outside so the Red Cross went through. Then they say, oh, this is just a nice place. We gotta stop. Got one last question, sister. Okay, all right. But what it was was a concentration camp and moving people off to be killed. So my analysis is that that camp that was out in Oregon, that at the surface it was an Indian guru and he had all those Rolls Royces. And then they said free sex. And then all they had to do is tell black people, it's as much sex as you want. Mm -hmm. And it's white women who are giving up sex. Mm -hmm. And it's all the food that you want. <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? Like they can take away 99% of us. One train has free fried chicken. <laughs> a next train has all the Big Macs that you want. The next train, all the sex that you want. All the good crack and cocaine and a new drug that's called dynamite. So if you just get on the train, you can get as much as you want. So that leaves one-tenth of one percent of us left. Do you see, that's because of a built-in dependency. See, love me, give me something without me being critical of what it is. I think we had one last question. Where was it? Right. Yes. Okay, go ahead. My question is, what is the political significance of the word nigger and how should we use it? And how do we get black men away from black women and black women away from no. <laughs> black men and black women away from What, my brain is tired, I don't know if I can keep up with that. <laughs> you know, we've already talked about it. We just say that we recommend to counter white supremacy, no black man or no black woman have sexual intercourse with a white person until white supremacy is ended all over the world. 
Now you don't go up and choke some black person to try to make that white person leave them alone. See, because no black person gets a white person. A white lady gets a black man, a white man gets a black lady. We are victims of white supremacy. We do not go chasing down white people. If you don't believe it, just run after some white man of your choice or white woman. <laughs> Without them announcing availability, right? Okay, for children, I mean, we have to talk to younger people in the same way that we're talking to each other now. Help them understand after we help ourselves understand, understand what the war is, be determined to eliminate the war in the shortest possible time. Take care. Okay.